I'm Antonio Colombo and uh, I'm uh, here to discuss uh, where to use drug-coated balloon in current uh, practice. Uh, before we go to the, uh, to the current presentation, I want to uh, say two statements. One that I have no conflict uh, to disclose. And the second is to summarize the agenda of this uh, symposium. First will be my lecture. I will go over uh, instant wrist stenosis, uh, small vessel and long diffuse disease. Then uh, Dr. Bernardo Cortese uh, will discuss uh, Sirolimus uh, coated balloon and appraisal on its potential advantages over Pacitaxel. He will uh, discuss the Cazzanus meta-analysis, uh, difference between Lanus and Pacitaxel. Uh, and then uh, the nanolute uh, technology specific uh, uh, to magic touch uh, uh, drug coated balloon, and then uh, uh, present briefly uh, two uh, studies, uh, Transform One and CIRPAC uh, study, which are ongoing uh, studies. And finally, Dr. Sandeep uh, Bazavarajan will uh, discuss uh, uh, and present uh, cases uh, about the use of. Uh, Sirolimus coated balloon in clinical practice with a real life case population. Then we'll have a round table discussion and conclusions. So we go directly to my presentation. First is about usage of drug coated balloon in instant stenosis. If you look at the WIPS4 study and the Daedalus meta-analysis, uh, we conclude that there is uh, an advantage of uh, drug eluting stent over drug coated balloon. So does this mean uh, that uh, the case is closed and there is no room for drug coated balloon for instant stenosis? My answer is uh, no. Uh, there is uh, uh, room uh, for uh, uh, drug uh, coated balloon, but we need uh, to address uh, two issues. Optimal lesion preparation before usage of drug coated balloon and uh, willing to cross over to drug eluting stent when the criteria are not met. And I believe this aspect was not uh, strictly maintained in a, a number of uh, uh, randomized studies and registries. And um, even more importantly, usage of new drug coated balloon with better late loss, a late loss below the traditional uh, 0.035, which was uh, typical for Pacitaxel uh, eluting uh, balloons. Uh, to address the first question or the first issue, which is adequate versus inadequate lesion preparation, uh, we uh, published uh, in 2016 a retrospective analysis of instant wrist stenosis uh, treated with the drug coated balloon and uh, PTCA uh, prior to drug coated balloon. And uh, we looked at uh, 98 uh, adequate lesions uh, with uh, good uh, preparation and treatment with drug coated balloon versus 68 lesion where the lesion preparation was inadequate. Nevertheless, we utilized drug coated balloon. We will not repeat uh, this uh, strategy nowadays, but uh, in 2016, we really did not uh, separate and we used drug coated balloon in both. And uh, if you do that, the results are uh, like in this uh, curve. On the uh, or vertical axis, you see the event rate and the horizontal axis time. In red, you see the event rate with inadequate lesion preparation and in blue with adequate lesion preparation. You see that the two curves have a clear difference, which means that uh, uh, inadequate lesion preparation is a marker for poor outcome. So these uh, lesions should not be treated uh, with drug coated balloon, but should be immediately crossed over uh, to uh, stenting. So um, uh, 
regarding the small vessel issue, uh, I would say that uh, uh, all the topic is well summarized in the back small uh, uh, study, uh, which uh, randomized uh, 382 patients to drug coated balloon with a mass rate of 7.5% versus 376 uh, lesions randomized uh, to drug eluting stent with a mass rate of 7.3. So basically, uh, the non inferiority is clearly met. The study was published in Lancet in 2018, confirming uh, the role of uh, basket of uh, drug coated balloon to treat lesions located in small vessels. Uh, on the same uh, issue, uh, we conducted a few years before the Bello study. And here I would like to show you the long term result, the three years result of an old technology, Paclitaxel eluting uh, balloon, with uh, maintained uh, difference in blue of uh, uh, freedom from events uh, at three years. So I believe uh, we have also some supporting evidence that this uh, approach uh, works. So the small vessel issue uh, is uh, fairly accepted and uh, we have clear uh, this area too. Uh, lesions in a native vessel, not necessarily on the small vessels. Here you see uh, a lesion at the ostium of the circumflex. This is not a small vessel, but is a lesion prone to very high rate of risk stenosis. We now try to avoid stenting. We treat uh, uh, these lesions uh, with aggressive lesion preparation. In this case, cutting balloon with an excellent uh, result. Uh, we try to utilize IBUS guidance, and then uh, we uh, apply drug coated balloon uh, without stenting. Uh, we avoid the uh, carina shift toward the LAD and uh, you see a very nice immediate result and uh, we are collecting uh, long-term uh, data and hopefully in the future we will be able uh, to give you uh, the follow-up in a reasonable number of lesions uh, treated uh, in this fashion. Uh, this is the uh, IBUS uh, uh, immediate with uh, a nice uh, cross-sectional area of 9.2 at the ostium of the lesion. Again, this is a condition uh, to meet before applying the drug coating balloon. If you don't get a good immediate result, uh, you have to cross over to stenting. Another issue in a long lesion, uh, native vessel, not necessarily small, this intermediate uh, branch, which could be treated with a long stent, but again, to avoid the long stent, uh, we apply good lesion preparation, uh, dilatation in this case. Following dilatation, there is a dissection. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we are not necessarily afraid of dissection and we don't leave the dissection unless we can interrogate the dissection. In this case, uh, the dissection was interrogated with uh, PAPD, pressure gradient uh, proximal to distal and there was a pressure gradient of 0 0.8, which shows basically that there is no flow limitation. And then we were uh, relaxed to apply drug coated balloon technology and do not implant the stent. Uh, a more extreme uh, case uh, is uh, in this diffuse disease LED, there is a focal lesion at the origin of a big uh, uh, diagonal and a lot of diffuse disease distally. You can place a short stent uh, at the bifurcation and do nothing distally, or you can treat uh, all the vessel, but we try to avoid stenting, especially in such a tortuous uh, situation. Uh, we did the baseline measurement of the uh, fractional flow reserve utilizing uh, uh, QCA technology, basically QFR. You see the vessel all red, means that the uh, value is uh, below uh, 0.7, in this case, uh, value of uh, 0.62. Uh, 
uh, diffuse disease uh, starting uh, from the diagonal lesions, we uh, predilated uh, this uh, vessel all the way, uh, including uh, the origin uh, of the diagonal. And uh, then after lesion preparation, you see a dissection, but again, uh, we evaluated that this dissection was non-flow limiting. You will see later on the QFR again. And then we applied uh, the flat coated balloon uh, uh, approach to the old vessel with uh, uh, two long uh, drag coated balloon uh, magic touch, 40 millimeter long. We did uh, uh, IBUS as well to confirm uh, uh, the uh, lumen. I don't go over details, but uh, I just have uh, single frames below showing a good lumen despite the presence of a dissection. And uh, uh, again, the final uh, is uh, in this uh, slide where you see good uh, distal flow uh, following uh, uh, implementation of drug uh, coated balloon or drug eluting balloon with magic touch. And uh, as I said, uh, besides the final angiography here, we have uh, the final uh, QFR uh, with the vessel which is not red at the beginning with a value of QFR, which is uh, very acceptable uh, with a small red uh, segment, very, very distal in, uh, in the vessel. So this is a very unique approach to avoid a full metal jacket utilizing drug coated balloon with some functional confirmation that the result obtained is uh, stable. So uh, should we take over some lesions that are uh, now uh, stented with drug coated balloon technology? The answer is, uh, is yes, as, uh, as you've seen. Uh, drug coated balloon should be utilized uh, in general, only after successful lesion preparation, and most probably utilizing other technologies like IBUS or FFR to confirm this statement. Uh, a recent study published by Park showed that the pressure gradient proximal to distal mm -hmm. less than 10 millimeter is uh, uh, adequate to confirm uh, good lesion preparation. Uh, we use a little bit more liberal uh, of 0 0.15, 0 0.20. Uh, and uh, if this is, uh, is followed, uh, you can safely apply the technology. So success, unsuccessful lesion preparation uh, should lead to drug eluting stent implantation and this should be a, a criteria not to use a drug coated balloon. Thank you for your attention. So hello everybody, this is Bernardo Cortese, interventional cardiologist uh, from Milano. And my task today is to discuss about uh, uh, the querel between uh, Sirolimus and Pacritaxel, which one is the best one. Actually, I will not give you a final answer, but uh, will give you some data. Um, I need, uh, yeah, this is my conflict of interest regarding this presentation. Um, uh, we, we should start from um, this very first slide showing the Katsanos meta-analysis and the um, attributed increased risk of death after uh, PCB or PES use uh, in a femoral pupillar arena after two and after four to five years. So there was an increase in total mortality after the use of this type of devices in this uh, meta-analysis. The third thing that um, comes into the attention is that uh, um, after one year, there was no uh, difference between coated and uncoated devices uh, in this arena. So this is uh, quite strange because we know that, uh, especially with drug-coated balloons, we deliver the drug immediately and we suppose it, it uh, will remain on the vessel wall for a few weeks uh, after inflation. So this is the first point that uh, um, was uh, inputted to this uh, meta-analysis. However, all, all of us know uh, the uh, toxicity of pacritaxel when administered via uh, the systemic uh, um, 
um, way. And so we know that it mostly is associated uh, with the thrombocytopenia and leukopenia. And the risk of adverse events may be very high at high dosages for this drug. We have also to admit that uh, the release uh, of this drug after drug cotabulin use is quite different if compared to the release uh, uh, of this, the same drug uh, for cancer patients uh, uh, during chemotherapy. So uh, it is uh, very different to the total dosage of drug that we administer in our patients. And uh, to put some more fuel on the topic, there is this analysis from the group of Schneider and Zeller showing how the total dosage of paclitaxel administered to peripheral patients was not associated to an increase in death. Uh, dividing the total dosages into three to sites uh, for the three groups of patients. So no difference uh, uh, depending on the different dosage of drug administered by means of drug cotabalum. However, all of us know and remember the tax stent and what happened to the first patients which were treated by means of bare metal stent after drug coated balloon, paclita coated balloon use in the coronary and peripheral artery, we have seen an increase in thrombosis, either symptomatic thrombosis, so stent thrombosis, but also uh, in this study uh, done in autopsy patients uh, uh, with uh, asymptomatic thrombosis. So uh, the combination between bare metal stent, any metal, and paclitaxel is not good for our patients. Now we have understood that uh, uh, very well. What about the coronary arteries? This is a good news. Uh, uh, there is no signal, uh, at least from this meta-analysis by Scheller and co-authors, no signal of increase in total death after three years uh, by means of use of drug of the balloons, paclitaxel of the balloons uh, in the coronary arena. So just uh, to put all of this information together, uh, which is uh, the final verdict about paclitaxel? Well, I have to tell you, I don't know, but what we have to understand and to underline is that uh, the pharmacodynamic of any PCB, but mostly of this drug cannot be simplified to the entire drug uh, that is loaded into the patient by means of PCI either with uh, paclitaxel, coated balloons, or stents, because this drug uh, has a, a pharmacokinetic property that is very, very variable, and it is very variable, the drug loss during uh, inflation, manipulation, and what it remains on the vessel wall, what goes in the flow. So it is very difficult to understand and to predict uh, the value and uh, the final effect of this drug. What is very important to underline is that uh, uh, we need uh, newer delivery system, newer carriers, and probably also newer drugs uh, to treat our patients uh, uh, with the drug coated balloon technology. And that's the reason why Cyrolimus has been studied a lot uh, in the last uh, 10 to 12 years. It is uh, a cytostatic drug which inhibits the mTOR uh, portion of the cells uh, those stopping the replication of the cell and so inhibiting the restenosis. Which are the main differences? We, we, we all know this slide, but I would like to uh, underline a few points about it, is that uh, the tissue absorption is very different between paclitaxel and serolimus. With paclitaxel is much faster, with serolimus is much lower. So uh, we have much more difficulties in order to have the drug up, uh, up the uploaded on the patient. The therapeutic range of the paclitaxel, we have seen that is very, very narrow, whereas it is uh, uh, much wider than serolimus. So serolimus can be considered a safer drug. And it also has a more potent antiristenotic effect, also because we can also give increased dosage for the same drug. The main problem, as I said before, is that the tissue absorption is, an, is not very easy to be achieved by means of giving just the drug. Uh, all of the studies that have been done previously, just giving the drug to the Western world did fail. So uh, that's why it took almost 10 years before having the first C marked C volumous coated balloon. And now we have a magic touch, which uses a quite complex technology called nanolute 
uh, it is a nanotechnology which uh, will uh, help Cerolimus to be protected uh, during uh, the um, loading on the drug water balloon, the manipulation, the transit, up until we reach the lesion. And this is the first characteristic of this uh, quite complex technology. The second characteristic is that it has a phospholipid bilayer, which helps these uh, nanoparticles or microparticles to be attached to the vessel wall and to exert their effect in the first three to four weeks after, uh, after inflation. We can see clearly this by the study from Pedro Lemos showing how the behavior of uh, serolimus uh, by means of this technology is quite the same of Paclitaxel, entering the vessel wall towards the adventitia during the first weeks after the intervention. And what about the drug in the other areas? Well, well we have seen clearly that after one month, the blood concentration of serolimus after magic touch use is zero, and it is zero also the total dosage of uh, uh, drug in any other segment instead of the one that has been treated uh, with magic touch. This is quite reassuring. And it is also reassuring the fact that uh, this drug, it cannot be found in any other organ, either kidneys, liver, or whatever of the body. We have a few data uh, about, uh, about this study, actually much more than few uh, to this very day. The first study was FASICO. It was a short-term registry that we did in our institution. And what we found was that the drug uh, the, 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 the device was used very easily with a very high angiographic and procedural success, no complications, and despite the complexity of the patient population enrolled, the rate of TLR was very low after six months. What about the native vessel disease, which, as Antonio said before, is one of the most interesting uh, settings for the use of drug water balloon. Uh, we have done the Fasico Natives Registry. It is a single center registry with core lab by cardiologists, uh, native vessel disease up to three millimeters of diameter and six months angiographic follow up. The primary endpoint of the natives was uh, late lumen loss. And what we have seen, first of all, is that we had one third of the patients which had uh, a lumen enlargement. This is something that we have already seen with Papitaxel, and it is good to know that we have seen the same thing with the serolimus. And the other thing is that the late lumen loss was very low, like the first the best in class Papitaxel quarter balloons, 0.09 millimeters, with only two cases of binary stenosis. And then what about instant restenosis? This is a setting, uh, like Antonio said before, it's not the best setting for paclitaxel coated balloons. We have some preliminary data uh, with a magic touch showing that the TLR rate after two years is very low. It's 2.5% um, percent at, one, at one year, but after two years, it's only uh, 5.8. So it is quite the same, no late catch up in this very difficult setting for our patients. And now we have the largest study that uh, um, has ever done, been done with the drug coated balloons. This is the Eastman Registry. It's an old camera international prospective registry. We will follow up the patients up to three years. And we have already presented a one year follow up of the first 1,000 patients. What we have seen is that uh, at the interim analysis uh, with the events which have not yet been adjudicated after one year, we have seen that the TLR rate uh, is very low and there is no uh, thrombotic complication and the MACE rate is low as well at 5.8%. Instant restenosis patients, the same uh, MI and death total were very low. TLR rate was 5.4% like nanolute registry and MACE rate 8.6%, 278 patients after one year. And I'm really proud to say that now we, have, uh, we are going to finish the enrollment. We have reached 1,908 patients. So we are very close to the goal of 2,000 patients. And I think that within one or two months, we will stop the enrollment of ASPORN and we go do during the follow-up to see how this device is working. What about the future? We have the Transform 2 study, which is a spontaneous multicenter international study which will aim to see in native vessel disease, which is uh, the performance of magic touch versus uh, 
uh, science. And this is a randomized clinical trial, one to one, and the late tumor loss will be the primary endpoint. We will also have an OCT substudy in the transform two. And then we have a transform one study. This is a sponsorized study, vessel size up to 2.5, lesion length up to 30 millimeters. This is the group of investigators that will enroll patients during transform one. This is an extraordinary group of investigators and we're really proud to be part of this group. In this study, the primary endpoint will be net lumen gain. And as I said, the randomization after predilatation and the absence of major dissection will be done between magic touch and sequent please, which is one of the best in class paclitaxel coated balloons for a coronary field. After predilatation, we will do OCT. So in case the patient will have a real small vessel disease, the patient will be treated uh, with one of the two devices with a randomization in a one-to-one -one fashion. And we will have a six month centralized QCA to assess the primary endpoint. And the very big news about uh, this device and the comparison with Paclitaxel is the CIRPAC study, which uh, we'll be presenting during this uh, uh, virtual Euro PCR as a late breaking trial. This is an indirect comparison between the ISPO one year uh, registry data that I showed you before and uh, the um, DCB RISE study with the Allotax SV. And you can see here by propensity matching that there is no significant difference uh, in terms of clinical follow-up after one year between Sivolimus and one of the best in class Paclitaxel coated balloons. So my conclusions, Katsanus meta-analysis is probably, it's for sure an earthquake in the field of interventional cardiology and also for peri in the peripheral field. However, this meta-analysis is flowed by major statistical drawbacks. Uh, there is some biological plausibility showing that paclitaxel may be harmful in at least some of our patients, mostly first-generation paclitaxel coated balloons. Newer devices, better designed randomized clinical trials and long-term follow-up will be the answer in order to have more reliable data about uh, the setting. Magic Touch is the first serial muscular balloon and it has the C mark either for coronary and peripheral and it's showing very promising data. The CIRPAC study showed that it's the clinical equivalence with one of the most recent and uh, up-to-date PCB. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Euro PCR and Concept Medical for giving us this opportunity to share our experience on Magic Touch in this very unique uh, symposium at the virtual uh, Euro PCR. So my name is uh, Sandeep Basavarajaya. I'm a cardiologist uh, in Birmingham uh, in the United Kingdom. So in this uh, presentation, I would like to share our experience with Magic Touch uh, for cases and data from our real world population. So, I do not have any conflicts of interest to declare uh, for this particular talk. So, in this topic, I would like to focus on the introduction and indications for DCB in our clinical practice, followed by some data and cases from our center. So, we embarked use of Magic Touch uh, in our center since April 2018, and in so far, we have used in over 400 patients in our practice. Now, the use of DCB in our practice is generally in pretty much most restenotic lesions, irrespective of the stent type, whether it's a bare metal or a drug reading stent uh, restenosis. Diffuse small vessel disease, where would, we would not, uh, like not to implant a stent because it increases the risk of restenosis and stent thrombosis in the long term. Important side branch ostium, as uh, shown by Dr. Colombo, one of the case, uh, circumflex ostium, where uh, the Medina classification is classically 001 and it's very difficult to uh, place a stent right at the ostium without coming back into the main branch. So this is an ideal indication for use of DCB. And finally, patients who can't take uh, dual antiplatelet therapy for extended period of time, so especially patients awaiting a cancer surgery or any urgent surgery, if they have a significant coronary lesions, we can use DCB because you only can give a DAPT for just a month. 
So this is a retrospective analysis of patients treated at two centers in the United Kingdom. So our hospital, which is Heartlands Hospital in Birmingham and Harefield Hospital in London. So we show data from March 2018 up until February 2019. Uh, during this period, we had treated uh, 373 lesions in 288 patients with a mean age of 66. So if you focus on the demographic characteristics, the most highlighting thing is the diabetes, which was present in almost 40% of patients. And if you look at the indication for DCB in our practice, uh, diffuse long lesions, the classically seen in patients with uh, diabetes. We had uh, around 10% of patients with uh, uh, chronic kidney disease, and most of the lesions were treated in the setting of acute coronary syndrome, which included 54%, and then 46% it was in stable angina. If you look at the procedural statistics, so de novo lesions accounted for more than 60% of the cases, uh, with restenosis uh, accounting for around 38% of cases. Pre-dilatation was done in 92% of cases. Um, this was our initial practice, but we have changed. Uh, now we go 100% pre-dilatation. Uh, and most of the pre-dilatations were done with the non compliant balloons, followed by scoring and cutting balloons, and a small proportion of patients also had rotational atherectomy. In regards to further procedural characteristics, most of the lesions were treated in the LAD D1 bifurcation, followed by circumference system and uh, right coronary artery. We also had a small number of patients with uh, disease in their vein grafts and left main stem. The bailout stenting was relatively low. It was around 9%. And uh, in our practice, we only undertake bailout stenting if there is a recall of more than 50% or if there is a flow-limiting dissection. So we had around 18 cases of uh, flow-limiting dissection, which needed stenting. And around 17 cases, we had more than 50% recoil. The mean um, diameter of the DCB was 2.6 millimeter and the mean length was 24 millimeter, indicating these are uh, small vessel long lesions. During a median follow-up of uh, 12 months, um, all patients had at least six months follow-up unless they died within that follow-up period. The death happened uh, in 10 cases, accounting to 3.4%. But the cardiac death was low, 1.7%, and the target vessel MI was also low, around 3.4%. The TLR per lesion in this complex group of patients was 12%, with an overall mace of 10%. We had no cases of acute vessel closure documented in our uh, experience so far. If you focus just on the de novo lesion subsets, uh, we had around 233 lesions and 186 patients. Um, Again, if you focus on the mean diameter of the, uh, the vessels, 2.4 millimeter, indicating these are small vessels, and the mean length of the lesions were 25 millimeter, indicating these are long lesions. So the outcome uh, in the de novo lesion group is excellent with a very small uh, uh, cardiac death, 1.7%, and a small proportion of them had a target of LMI, around 2%. And the TLR was 9% and the overall mace rate was 6%. Again, we had no cases of acute vessel closure. With this, I would like to uh, share our paper, which was published just only two weeks ago in the CCI, uh, in the same data which I've shown, uh, and it is online. I would like to now move on to some case-based examples uh, from our center. So this was a case of a 64-year-old man with crescendo angina, and he had a uh, one long triggering stent way back in 2016 when he had presented with inferior myocardial infarction. The angiogram this time had demonstrated an intra stent occlusion, as you can appreciate here. So he an underwent an angioplasty to this. With the help of uh, Gaia 2 and 3 wire, uh, we crossed the lesion. Um, and once we confirmed the distal wire position, comma, we, we pre dilated this uh, lesion. Uh, quite aggressively with a non compliant balloon and scoring balloons. And then we performed an IVUS, which revealed that the stent was grossly undersized for the vessel, which was 3.5 to 4 millimeter. Following this, we used uh, 3.5 and a 4 millimeter uh, magic touch uh, to achieve an excellent angiographic result. As you could appreciate, there's a TME3 flow and no residual stenosis. So we accepted this. Patient came back for a check angiography at six months, and we were very impressed with the outcome of the angiogram because uh, 
the artery was still open with no recoil and patient was asymptomatic. This is a case which was done recently in our center only three weeks ago. This is a chap who's a 50 year old man with a non ST elevation myocardial infarction and he had a PCI to LAD and circumflex way back in 2012. The angiogram uh, demonstrated the stent in the circumflex uh, had restenosed, uh, but the LAD stent was patent. And as you can appreciate in this still picture, there is a restenosis in the circumflex ostium. And given his presentation, we thought this was the culprit. So after uh, ballooning gently, we did an IVUS, which, as you can appreciate here, the stent was clearly undersized for the vessel. This case demonstrates that the use of IVUS IVS is very important when dealing with restenotic lesions. In addition, there was also calcification within the, within the stent, which you can appreciate in this IVUS. So these are some still pictures showing uh, gross undersizing of the vessel here. So the red dots on the left hand screen shows the actual vessel uh, uh, diameter of the area. Uh, whereas the one with the white arrow shows the standard segment, which was uh, grossly undersized. So then uh, this is another great picture which shows that the proximal uh, reference vessel was clearly five millimeter and the distal reference vessel was 4.5. And the stent they had used was 2.5, which was taken to 3 millimeter in 2012. So after using a non-compliant balloon, 4.5 under 5 millimeter, we used um, a long magic touch. But before that, we repeated the IVUS. And I can, as you can appreciate, on the left-hand side, you could see the pre-procedure um, IVUS. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you could see the post-procedure IVUS, where you could see there's a significant expansion of the stent. This is another picture, so you could see this is the use of magic touch, and we had an excellent uh, final result. Patient will undergo a check angiography uh, in a few months' time, and I'll be looking forward to seeing this good result uh, in the patient. So this is a, a third case of a bifurcation lesion. So this had a significant stenosis in the circumflex artery involving a large obtuse marginal and an AV circumflex. Patient also had a right coronary artery occlusion. So we treated this left system first. So he had a one long regarding stent to the main branch, after which we were not very happy with the uh, appearance of the side branch, which had slow flow. So we recrossed, ballooned it, and then used a, a long uh, magic touch here. Uh, because it's a fluoroscopic image, you may not see this very well, so which is why I put an arrow. You can see the balloon. And uh, we had a result like this at the end. Although it may not look as good as the stented segment, but we know that this will positively remodel. So patient came back for a staged PCI to RCA CTO in three months time. And as you can appreciate, the angiogram of the left system looks very impressive, especially the side branch looks positively remodeled. And if you look, compare the pictures from post procedure on the left hand side of the screen and on the right hand side, which is the, sorry. So this the left hand side is the post procedure and the one on the right hand side is the follow up angiography and you could appreciate the positive remodeling. My last case is very interesting. This is a case of a, a elderly man who had a, a vein graft to his LAD um, and he came in with angina and uh, what we noticed was that he had a significant uh, stenosis in the insertional point uh, of the graft into the LAD as you can see in this arrow. Uh, the problem in treating this with the stent is that one, there is a size mismatch between the vein graft and the LAD. And also, if you do put a stent in, then you lose the future option of opening the native LAD if patient has any issue with the vein graft. So after uh, pre-dilating this lesion with uh, non-compliant balloon and scoring balloon, we used a magic touch, uh, 3 by 15 millimeter, uh, and the results uh, were very impressive post-procedure. So I appreciate that there is an uh, excellent result post-procedure. And a patient came back uh, for follow-up angiography at 18 months when he had some atypical chest pain. And as you can see, 
uh, the streeted segment appears positively remodeled and it looks very nice on angiogram. And if I compare the two, that is the post DCB on the left hand side and the follow up at 18 months, you could appreciate that there is a positive remodeling of the vessel. So this is an ideal indication for use of DCB. So in conclusion, DCBs are excellent alternative to stents where they are not desirable, like restenotic lesions, small vessel diffuse disease, osteal side branch, and patient unable to take. Uh, DAPT for an extended period of time. So our experience with the Magic Touch has been excellent with low rates of heart endpoints, especially cardiac death and target of SLMI. We had acceptable rates of TLR and MACE despite a very complex group of patients, 40% diabetic, 10% CKD, more than 50% of them were in the setting of acute coronary syndrome, and uh, we also had a long diffuse lesions, uh, most of them. The results are encouraging, although we need more long-term data, and it is encouraging to see so many studies which is being currently planned, and the follow-up in our center is ongoing. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you, Sandeep. Uh, uh, Antonio, we have seen uh, very, very beautiful cases with this device, and I think that you have uh, underlined some of the key messages that should be done when we have to face uh, DCBPCI. The first one is that uh, uh, it is really key to correctly prepare the lesion. And Antonio has shown us how this is clearly correlated uh, with the uh, failure or not of the CBPCI. And the second point uh, underlined by Sandeep is that uh, uh, you should keep the stenting rate with any type of stent as low as possible after, uh, after DCB. Um, I would like to ask uh, uh, Antonio one question. Um, we have seen uh, from the very beginning uh, of our experience with Magic Touch that this device has a very good uh, trackability and deliverability. So it is easier to use this device in more complex lesions. And I would like to have your opinion on this and if, if you have extended the use of drug of the balloons after Magic Touch came into the market. Uh Bernardo, uh, I totally agree with you that the delivery of this uh, balloon is uh, very easy. It comes uh, uh, in between uh, a semi-compliant balloon and the best uh, DS. It's a little bit uh, uh, on a scale 1 to 10. If you give 10 uh, the semi-compliant balloon, I will give uh, for deliverability, this balloon eight, and the best drug eluting stent, I will give seven. So is uh, superior to the best drug eluting stent and is slightly inferior to the best uh, semi-compliant balloon. What, what, what do you think about the deliverability? Because we've seen that uh, other devices uh, um, with Paclitaxel has slightly improved uh, their deliverability and trackability. Uh, but what I have always uh, asked myself is that how is it possible to have, uh, okay, we have a new concept balloon, it's, very, it's working very well, but uh, uh, how is it possible to have such a complex technology on this balloon in order to have it uh, uh, very effective, uh, but also very deliverable and trackable? So, uh, Sandeep, how did uh, the use of any type of drug balloon change since uh, Magic Touch came into your catalog? I think it is reflected in our practice that when uh, we brought this technology to our center, my um, I expected that we'll probably use around 20, 30% of Magic Touch and 70% Sequent Neo, which we were using. But then it completely turned the other way around where people started using Magic Touch more because it's so deliverable uh, from the outset and uh, it was embarked very quickly. I totally agree that I've not thrown out any K, any any magic touch balloon so far where I could not deliver within two minutes. Whereas sequent, please, Neo, although the best in the, as you said, the packet axle, we have issues when it comes to tortuous lesions, especially when you're delivering in the distal RCA, PDA branches. Even with the guide liner, we struggle, especially if it's the long balloons you're using. What about uh, your experience with the uh, uh, native vessel disease? So we started using that for the balloons with the instant restenosis uh, 10 years ago. Uh, now we have seen uh, some data that sh show that uh, DES is probably uh, better, not only in terms of angiographic follow-up, but also in terms of TLR, which is a hardening point for us and for this type of lesions. 
in this setting. Uh, we have data, we have seen that uh, almost seems to work well also in the SR setting. Uh, also because uh, in, in this registry that we have seen, uh, there are not very simple uh, instant stenosis lesions. So uh, they are more diffuse. We also put uh, in this one, for example, some total occlusions. Uh, but uh, moving from ISR, uh, my belief is that uh, also the technical characteristics of this device may um, uh, increase the use of this device also in native vessel disease. So in your cath lab, Antonio and Sandeep, did you see an increase in the use of CD native vessel disease uh, with Magic Touch? Or it's quite the same as before? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely, Bernardo. We have uh, we have seen uh, uh, the usage uh, of uh, drug coated balloon in native vessels, non small vessels. Uh, as a matter of fact, it is not rare that we implant a short stent in the proximal uh, segment of the lesion, and instead of using a very long stent, we treat. Uh, uh, the rest uh, uh, of the lesion of the vessel with the long drug coat balloon. By doing this, uh, we use the stent in a focal way and uh, we avoid uh, the usage of extensive stenting and uh, we are totally away from the full metal jacket uh, unless you really have uh, an extensive dissection or maybe a total occlusion with a poor result. So I think uh, uh, the combination of a focal stenting plus a drug coat balloon distally is a new way uh, to approach uh, long lesions. Yeah, this is the same philosophy that we share. And so what do you think? Do you think that the, the time has come to do a randomized study between a full metal jacket uh, in multivector disease and the short proximal stent and drug coat balloon for the distal part of the lesions? I think, uh, I think so, especially uh, long stents. I think uh, when you have to implant a stent over 30 millimeter, I believe uh, uh, you can uh, uh, do uh, randomization between drug coat balloon and long stain. Of course, uh, you have to be willing to do an immediate crossover of about 20%, because in some cases you will have a dissection that you don't want to leave it as it is. But uh, uh, accepting uh, an immediate crossover of 20 to 30%, uh, you can avoid. Uh, long stent in a number of lesions with all the benefit we know, eh? including the positive remodeling that you showed uh, pretty convincingly. I would like to uh, make a point and also ask your opinion on the bailout stenting. Now, if I'm treating a 40 millimeter a long lesion and if there is a, a dissection uh, involving a certain segment and if I'm worried that it will progress to a flow limiting, I tend to use a very short stent just for that segment and leave the rest of the DCB segment uh, without a stent. Uh, is this something which uh, you agree or uh, should we cover the whole uh, uh, treated segment? No, no, I think uh, uh, this is something that we have done for, uh, for years. We published a paper in Jack about uh, focus stenting uh, a spot stenting many years ago. And we also have now long-term follow-up of patients treated with a drug coated balloon and drug eluting stent on the same lesion. This has been a, a lot of uh, trepidation to use two drugs or to use double dose of the same drug. And we have not seen any long-term uh, adverse event or effect. We didn't see any vessel aneurysm or uh, any risk of late thrombosis. And we have now a follow-up uh, over three, four years. I do remember that study, one of the, I think, a combination synergy, it's called synergic uh, effect with the paclitaxels, uh, DCB and uh, a bailout standing with the uh, Lima stent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We. 
We never wanted to do a, a prospective randomized study because uh, we never found uh, uh, economical support to do a, a, an animal study that was needed uh, before doing a randomized study, but we have uh, really now long-term follow-up uh, of many patients with both uh, Lymus plus Lymus or uh, Pachytaxel plus Lymus with no adverse events. Okay, so I think uh, what, uh, what can we take home uh, from this uh, uh, symposium? I would say that uh, instant restenosis is still uh, a main area where you should utilize uh, uh, drug coated balloons because uh, you, you should try to avoid to place another layer of metal. Uh, nevertheless, uh, you cannot dismiss uh, optimal lesion preparation. And uh, I would say almost every case of instant stenosis uh, should be evaluated with IBUS in order to. Uh, determine if you have inadequate uh, stent expansion. I think uh, uh, examples were shown uh, in this uh, symposium. Uh, second area is uh, native vessels. And uh, native vessels uh, does not only apply to small vessels, where the use of drug-coated balloon is well established by large registry and uh, randomized studies. Uh, but should be extended in uh, native vessels, uh, in native vessels in some type of lesions like osteal lesions, bifurcational lesions, where usage of stents uh, is uh, still suboptimal. And uh, to conclude, uh, the availability of uh, new drug coated balloons uh, able uh, to give you a late loss uh, which is uh, similar to the late loss uh, of uh, Limus stents, uh, will allow to have uh, not only immediate and short-term results uh, similar uh, to uh, drug eluting stents, but will guarantee uh, the possibility to have positive remodeling at the long term. And uh, please do not dismiss also the fact that uh, uh, drug coated balloon does not demand uh, long term dual antiplatelet therapy. And this technology, even if we did not cover this aspect in this symposium, is a good uh, alternative in patients who cannot uh, uh, take a long term dual antiplatelet therapy, who may need uh, uh, immediate surgery uh, or some other uh, procedure or they are at high risk for bleeding. So uh, drug coated balloons are not an alternative to stenting, but are a good way uh, to improve the result uh, of uh, revascularization with catheter-based technologies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.